This is AutoLine Daily, the show dedicated to enthusiasts of the global automotive industry. There's still a lot of bad news in the automotive industry due to the coronavirus crisis, but there are some glimmers of hope. First, the bad news, and we start in Europe. It was hard to believe it was only two months ago that Daimler was projecting significantly higher profits this year. Not anymore. Its EBIT profit plummeted 78% in the first quarter. That's not good, but at least its car and truck operations were able to post a profit. Even so, Daimler said it will cut 10,000 jobs over the next two years, even if the market fully recovers. In France, Renault is looking for financial help from the French government to make sure it does not run out of cash, even though it slashed spending. And meanwhile, in Russia, the government is afraid that the virus crisis will cause other automakers to abandon the market, like GM and Ford did. Wards reports that the Russian government will provide direct financial support for R&D and plant modernization. The governor of St. Petersburg says he's going to cut the tax on profits. But we'd point out there isn't going to be any profits to tax anyway. Now, over to Asia. Hyundai says the first quarter was bad, with sales down 24%. In March alone, its sales were down 40%, and it expects the second quarter to be even worse. In Japan, Nissan reported its first quarterly loss in over a decade. But okay, now let's get to a little bit of the good news. There's been one very noticeable benefit to this coronavirus lockdown, cleaner air. According to a new report from IQ Air, a Swiss company that collects air quality data, air pollution levels have dropped anywhere from 9% to 60% in 10 major global cities during the lockdown. The study looked at fine particulate pollution compared to the same period a year ago. In Delhi, London, Los Angeles, New York, Madrid, Mumbai, Rome, Sao Paulo, Seoul, and Wuhan, all those cities saw a decrease except for Rome, which is actually up 30%. But Delhi saw the largest decrease with its pollution plunging 60%. And in some other good news, car sales in the U.S. didn't fall as badly as was expected. Of course, it's all relative. LMC Automotive says retail sales were down 48% in April, and normally that would be considered a complete disaster. But analysts were expecting the 80% drop that we saw in China in February. We've got a terrific AutoLine After Hours coming up this afternoon with Bob Gellion, who's one of the foremost battery experts in the world. We'll be asking him about cost reduction, recycling, charging, and a host of other EV topics. We'll be taking your questions, too, so send an email to viewermail at autoline.tv or tweet it to us at AutoLine. Anton Wallman from Seeking Alpha will also be on board. So join Gary Vasilash and me for some of the best insights into the automotive industry. Hyundai has taken a different approach with cutting emissions. While the rest of the world is plunging into battery electric vehicles, the Korean automaker is still committed to fuel cells. Last year, the company announced it's exploring bringing fuel cell-powered commercial vehicles to the U.S. market. I spoke to Jerome Grejois, the senior manager for powertrain at Hyundai, and he went into more details about its fuel cell commercial vehicle strategy. In heavy duty, uh, and the goal of a truck is really to move a weight from one place to the other. And if you really want to get a lot of distance, uh, you need to put a lot of battery, and that's uh, kind of hurting the payload. Uh, so fuel cells have a, a benefit in that situation uh, on the heavy duty. And there's uh, some efforts from Hyundai currently overseas. The first application that we'll see is uh, in Switzerland. Uh, where some trucks will actually be deployed this year. And um, it's uh, not quite a long haul the way we have them in the, uh, in the U.S. It's more like a box truck that's going to do some uh, grocery delivery. But at the scale uh, of Switzerland, which is you know, maybe uh, Southern California expanding into the, the Central Valley. Um, and uh, so, you know, after that, that first application, uh, we'll definitely uh, be looking at what we can do in the U.S. to 
to to create uh, to create a market and then uh, and then start helping areas like Southern California, for instance, that suffer quite a lot from from traffic of heavy duty. We have a very large port in LA, and a lot of the goods are uh, going elsewhere, and, and that's kind of not really helping our, our air quality goals. And of course, you can watch that entire interview right now on our YouTube channel. But while Hyundai is going headstrong into fuel cells, Kia is going all electric. It just shared more information about its Plan S, which is a $25 billion investment over the next five years, to switch the automaker from making ICEs to EVs. By 2025, Kia will have 11 new electric vehicles, including sedans, crossovers, SUVs, and multi-purpose vehicles. One of those new products will be shown off at the end of this year, and it will arrive in 2021 in the U.S. market. It will be Kia's first dedicated EV, meaning it will have no ICE variant, and it's going to be built on an all-new EV platform. Kia says it's a crossover that will blur the lines between CUV and passenger car. It mentioned the Habanero and the Imagine concepts when talking about the new EV, so we'd expect to see influences from both of them. And lastly, it's going to have a 300-mile range in the U.S. and a sub-20-minute recharge time when using a fast charger. Porsche is offering a new line of radios for its cars that have a classic look, but they're stuffed full of the latest technology. The radio units keep their classic look with rotary knobs and push buttons, and they're offered in two dimensions, which will fit cars from the 60s all the way up to the 1990s. Upgrades over the originals include touchscreens, Apple CarPlay, and navigation. Another improvement over previous versions is the ability to get digital radio stations. Prices range from about 1,440 euros to a little over 1,600. Auto Line Daily is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires. Your journey, our passion. You almost have to wonder how we were able to get anywhere before we had navigation in our cars. But wait, it is about to get better. And here's what the next generation nav will look like. The German consultancy IAV is working on a system where all you have to do is pair your phone with your car and tap on the next appointment on your calendar. The nav system will then calculate how you need to get there. But instead of you looking at a map on a screen in the car, the nav system highlights your route. In this case, it turns the lane that you're supposed to be driving in to green. So all you have to do is drive in the green lane. And if you come up upon some kind of obstruction or want to go a different way, the nav will recalculate your route on the fly in real time, just like it does today. But it will continue to highlight your path in green. It's all about the next generation of head-up display where the info is projected on the windshield. And it's safer because you always keep your eyes on the road instead of looking at a screen. Tula Technology is the company that developed dynamic cylinder deactivation that GM uses in a lot of its vehicles. And now Tula is partnering with Cummins. Ward's Auto reports that the two companies applied Tula's dynamic skip fire technology to one of Cummins' six-cylinder diesels that it uses in Class 8 semis. Not only did the engine see minor improvements in CO2 and fuel efficiency on the federal test procedure, it also achieved a massive 45% reduction in NOx emissions. They're still in the testing phase, but if Cummins adopts Tula's technology, it would take about three years to reach the market. The Toyota Yaris Cross just made its global debut. It was originally going to be unveiled at the Geneva Auto Show in March, but as you know, that show was canceled. And as you might guess by the vehicle's name, it's a crossover version of the Yaris. It's powered by a 1.5-liter three-cylinder engine that can be mated to either a CVT or a six-speed manual. A 1.5-liter hybrid powertrain is also available. The Yaris Cross goes on sale in Japan this fall and will be available in Europe in the middle of 2021. Ford's Mustang Cobra Jet has been tearing up drag strips since the 1960s, and now it's going all electric. While we're low on the details, here's what we do know. 
The Cobra Jet 1400, as the name implies, will have over 1,400 horsepower and more than 1,100 pound-feet of torque. That will help return a quarter-mile time in the low 8-second range at over 170 miles an hour. And for those of you wondering, a Tesla Model S can do the quarter-mile in 10.4 seconds, and the gasoline-powered Cobra Jet does it in the mid-8-second range, but at 150 miles an hour. And before we go, we just had to share the story that our viewer Bo from Winnipeg sent over to us. Two men in their 20s tried to hijack a car. They stabbed the driver in the leg and stole his phone and keys, but they couldn't make their getaway because the car had a manual transmission and they didn't know how to drive it. Turns out the driver is okay, but the Winnipeg police are still looking for the crooks. But all we can say is score another victory for the manual transmission. And with that, we wrap up today's report. Thanks for watching AutoLine Daily.